Okay. Um, so again, Joe Harrison here, and I'm going to moderate the questions for today. Um, so please begin populating those in the Q&A box, if you would. Um, I see where we have one in there already, but um, as you're beginning to populate those, uh, what I'm going to do is ask uh, a couple questions to get things kicked off here. Um, for both uh, Jeannie and Brian, how does the current marketplace uh, for your your particular uh, operations align with your core values? Um, it seems like um, that both of you shared some some basic core values. I, you know, obviously making an income and being profitable is part of that. But w what else is uh, drives you and, and uh, causes you to make decisions on your operations? Well, this is all about core value. Um, Joe, that's a great question. Core value, you know, for us, it's everything's been a logical step from um, working to enhance the resource in the late 80s through being willing to open the ranch gate, if you will, to third party audits for our stewardship, as well as animal husbandry to, to help increase confidence in the source that companies have of their food and fiber and also decrease their risk. But until we actually measure the results of what our management and practices are, we, can, we only have a set of, we have that narrative, we have species counts, we have yield data, we truly really don't know. Today through this measurement initiative, it has armed us with tools we never had before. And those are tremendously important to helping influence future management decisions and obviously, there are things outside our control that come into play, like it's been David mentioned about climate and so on, when you look at being in a contract. But we will always be adapting. We will always be adapting to changing factors, always. And I think that the measurement of our ecosystem impacts, those, those, that data is also helping guide us as we see these changes year to year to year. So the coming ecosystem services market, the carbon capture voluntary markets just fit perfectly with all of our intended work for many decades. And what it is, is I, I, I just, I'm, I'm sitting at the um, American Sheep Industry Natural, National Convention. In fact, I was just awarded the Innovation Award at the National Industry. I walked out of there and jumped on this computer immediately. And um, it's a recognition of leadership. And what I said was our hope, one of our hopes for the future is that if we measure these impacts with credible data and then get, you know, these markets have a whole series of steps and a whole set of checkpoints to verify that you're actually bringing a deliverable. So it's, these markets will have to be established on more than a list of practices. There will have to be data involved and there will have to be a guarantee that we get paid with improved performance. That's just, that's what's gonna give it value. But these market opportunities align with our core values of stewardship and natural resale health. And they also bring a framework for new stakeholders to be at the table investing in this climate smart and regenerative work on the ground. Those dollars that come through, however you frame it, as an offset or an inset, you, you, you're gonna, Dave is gonna be in the midst of helping look at and create these contracts that work for the buyer as well as for the grower to deliver economic value, added value into the projects and into the practices that achieve the goal that every citizen of the planet has that we retain the health and improve the health of our natural resources, which provide life to us, and at the same time ensure production so we continue to feed, clothe, and shelter the world. So I think they're completely aligned with our core values. And, and Brian, same question. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll give you a, a bit of a different perspective. Core values, obviously, just like Jeannie, uh, you know, those core values go back generations. Uh, you know, I, I think we've implemented just about every conservation practice you can think of on our farm, you know, uh, grass waterways, buffer streets, field borders, 
uh, terraces, uh, uh, both steep back terraces and broad base terraces, some with tile and then some without, a uh, no-till, uh, strip till, um, GPS technology uh, guiding our farm equipment and uh, both planting, spraying and harvest equipment over the fields. Um, you know, that's just kind of what we did prior to 2012 when we started to expand our operation by building the cattle barns and the digester. The digester, by the way, was commissioned in 2013, so we've been at that for almost 10 years. Uh, and how are we going to uh, take those core values that we as a, a family and, and, and it comes from both my wife and I, we both have that same core value. So that's what makes it really easy. And of course, that goes back generations in her side as well, because she comes from a farm family in central Iowa. But, you know, how do we move the, the core values that we bring to the table forward through carbon credit markets or the ability to, to capture the carbon, because that's what we're talking about today. That's where the real value is. Well, currently the way we're gonna evaluate that and, and monetize that hopefully as we start to produce renewable natural gas from our, our biogas, uh, from our organic waste streams is through the low carbon fuel standard or the renewable fuel standard and the RINs that are generated from the production of renewable fuels. But there's far more to it than that. And that's what I love to talk about is you know, the soil health that we've realized, uh, the improvements we've realized in our farm fields since 2012. We've got soil test data going back to 2012 that shows the organic matter improvements in our soils as the result of using the digestate from our digesters as our primary soil amendment or fertilizer source for nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and of course, organic matter. And the beauty of it is, you know, not only have we been digesting the beef cattle manure, uh, but we've also been digesting a lot of uh, industrial food waste from turkey processors, pork processors, um, uh, ethanol plants, biodiesel plants, uh, other uh, potato processor, for example, we get a potato waste. And so all of those organic substrates uh, are the, the carbon component of that, as well as the nutrients are going back to our fields to help improve that uh, organic matter content and the health of our soil. So we've seen organic matter contents improve by nearly 50% uh, in a period of five to seven years. I, I love to tell the story about how when our forefathers settled and started first plowing up the prairie, those soil organic matter levels were in the eight to 10% range. Uh, before we started this uh, process of returning all of that uh, organic waste to our fields in the form of digestate, uh, they had dropped to three and a half percent. That's not sustainable and that's a real problem, I think for agriculture and, and each of us, uh, whether there's producers here, or even researchers, scientists, we need to keep that in the back of our mind is that has to be one of the primary goals. How can we reverse that trend and start to turn that trend around? And we've seen that with uh, the use of our digestate in our farms. We're now looking at uh, organic matter content levels in the upper four to low 5% range in just a period of five to seven years. So that's what we're gonna, you know, then as we go forward, try to hopefully capture in terms of the monetization through the carbon sequestration uh, efforts that we've employed. So. Uh, a lot to look forward to. We have not signed a carbon credit contract yet. Uh, we are actively reviewing a number of options. And uh, we recently, uh, our partner, Raceline Alternative Energy, is the lead partner on a uh, USDA partnerships for commodity uh, smart, uh, commodity smart, uh, uh, commodities, uh, climate smart commodities grant program. Sorry, I'll get it out. And that $80 million grant that we received is going to help us uh, monetize, we think, the efforts that we've been uh, looking at doing of adding biomass from cover crops to our digesters, along with beef cattle manure, to produce the additionality, if you will, in trying to establish an even better market for the carbon that we think we're going to, uh, we can sequester uh, going forward. You know, when we first started looking at carbon uh, credit contracts, you know, we we're looking at 15 to $20 an acre for establishing, say, cover crops. Well, we think we're well beyond that. And we think that there's a higher value that we need to, you know, to look at because some of the additional uh, efforts we're employing with our, our facilities. So the, the contract that we have not settled on yet, I think is out there. Uh, it's just a matter of time, uh, but we're, we're being patient as to, you know, trying to make sure that there's a contract that we think works well, not only for us as the, as the generator of those carbon credits, but also uh, the buyer of those credits. And so we have a mutually beneficial arrangement going forward. Dave, would you like to also talk a little bit about the core value question? Yes, I would. And, and um, you know, I'm going to pick up on a, on a word that Brian just used. And actually, I think Jeannie did too, or at least a, a, a synonym for it. And that's sustainability. 
And remember, again, I started out my career as a banker and all of us, while they didn't, they're clearly, I, you can see the passion that both Jeannie and Brian have for, for how can they uh, improve from in their practices, but they're also both good business people. And so what they know is, how do I make what I'm doing sustainable? And that's where, that's what's exciting to me, uh, both having started as a banker and in my, in my history of working in the renewable energy industry, is this is a way for us to use another term, Brian, used to monetize those activities and those characteristics. Um, certainly early on when Jeannie was doing the things that she was doing, and Brian too, given the time frame, it was on because this is the right thing to do. But as we're able to access that value, and the other thing that's exciting to me with the sustainability, and I'm gonna throw out a term that gets used too often, but it's the adoption of technology. Uh, I work a lot in a, a couple of different business areas, and it's my belief that there is no other sector out there today that is adopt that agriculture is adopting technology faster than any other sector out there today and how we produce and market and consume foods and all those things. And this is one aspect of that, that we can really uh, use technology to capture the value, to communicate with that customer, just as Jeannie did when she was in, in her initial thing, what is it they want and what are they willing to pay for so that I can keep doing and do more uh, of the practices that I wanna do. So that's my take on core values. Okay, um, so we've had quite a few questions come in. So I think we're gonna uh, jump to those. Uh, they came in in QA box. And again, uh, don't be shy, uh, audience, go ahead and, and uh, tee up those questions if you would. Um, for Jeannie, um, as it relates to taking the soil samples uh, and, and reporting carbon, you indicated it's the top 20 centimeters or eight inches. Um, is that a typical depth for taking samples for carbon contracts? You're muted, Jeannie. Yeah, I just put together a three minute introduction. <laughs> so our, our sampling, our model, our data and research model is much broader than what you've got evidence of in two, those two examples. I gave simply two examples. So we're taking soil samples with a credible number of data points based upon the amount of acreage. So for instance, on 32,000 acres, we may have 21 sampling sites. And at each of those sites, we take 20 centimeter soil samples and down to 60 centimeter soil samples. We also take biomass samples. Those samples are uh, at GIS located monitoring points that are repeatedly we're going in in the early growing season and the post growing season twice a year on the sampling, which is much, much, much more than anybody will ever tell you you need to do. Most of the carbon companies are sampling one time to establish a baseline and then they don't come back for five years. I'm sampling twice a year on this much acreage. So, so we laid down more about 260 data points on the first million and a half acres. And we put down more than, uh, I don't know, 400 points at this point. So, and then the biomass and the soil samples are going to separate laboratories. They're all being peer, peer reviewed. And of course the findings are being, so I put up two slides. One was just a, a kind of the model uh, portrayal. The next was one slide of, of uh, our family ranch just at 20 centimeters, showing you in three years of high desert semi-arid landscape in a drought cycle, that even in 20, 21, and 22, in spite of the low rainfall, because of management, um, we are seeing significant, statistically significant increases year to year in our soil, in our carbon capture. And in fact, the averages for the last three years, which was completely out of line with what's projected, was that we are capturing 1.86 tons of carbon per acre on those uh, semi-arid rangelands. 
1.86 tons per acre over the last three. Okay, thank you. Um, and then a, a question on the RNG side of things for you, Brian. So um, the question is, is, is it a natural progression to go from creating electrical power uh, on anaerobic digestion projects to then moving to RNG? And uh, if that's a common progression, then should a producer actually kind of plan on that? And you know, what might be some of the timing? That's, that's an excellent question. Uh, actually, it has to do more with the markets and the, the monetization opportunities there are in the markets. When we commissioned our digesters and our generator in 2013, uh, September of 2013, uh, we were receiving 6.4 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, there, in Iowa, there's also a, what's called a renewable energy tax credit program, which added roughly another four cents. It's actually $4.50 per NMBTU, uh, but it added another roughly three to four cents per kilowatt hour on top of that. So at 10 to 10 and a half cents in that ballpark, we could make money at that level. Uh, however, after five years, that rate, we had a contract with our power company and after five years, that rate went down to 4.8 cents and it's actually going to continue to decline because of what they see as declining uh, electricity rates due to all of the, the additional uh, capacity that's come on the grid through solar and wind energy production. So it's very difficult for an electric, electricity producer in, a, in an anaerobic digester setting to compete against three and a half and four cent a kilowatt hour electricity from wind and solar. Uh, what may change that, however, and, and so let me back up. That's why as we look to the future, we knew that the, the renewable energy tax credit that was available in Iowa was gonna go away. It's a 10 year program. And, and at the end of 2023, we will be out of that 10 year program. Uh, so the way for us to look forward was the expansion at that time, uh, about three years ago, of the renewable natural gas industry and the low carbon fuel standard that was available in California. There were, uh, through the evaluation and, and testing of different facilities, anaerobic digestion facilities in both swine and dairy, there were some CI scores that were ranging from minus 350 to minus 450, which meant the value of the gas produced, instead of being say $4.50 or, or maybe $10 per MMBTU, was gonna be worth $100 per MMBTU through the low carbon fuel standard. So obviously the money started to flow to renewable natural gas development and expansion. And that's where we've seen most of the expansion occur over the last five years is in the dairies and swine operations because of the low uh, carbon intensity scores they can receive through their operations. And primarily the, the main reason they receive that is they're taking open lagoon manure storage structures, covering those structures with membranes to capture the biogas thereby avoiding the emissions of, of methane and CO2 into the atmosphere. Uh, and, and that greatly enhances their CO, uh, CI score, carbon intensity score. So that's really what's driven it is the CI scores, the vet monetization of that renewable natural gas as a result of those low CI scores uh, through low carbon fuel standards. But now as we look to the future, uh, there's a change that occurred. Uh, the EPA is now going to allow electricity to be included in the renewable fuel standard as a pathway. So if you can sell your electricity generated from an anaerobic digester or biogas facility to a car company, an electric car manufacturer, uh, suddenly you've got the opportunity to monetize electricity through the renewable fuel standard. So I'm not sure that we're gonna see a massive switch going forward from electricity generating digester facilities to renewable natural gas facilities. We may see some of those electricity generating digester facilities uh, continue to produce electricity if they can sign a contract with an OEM or, or uh, other you know, manufacturer of electric vehicles going forward. Uh, so that is gonna be a major switch. And when you combine that with the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed last year, there's tremendous incentives to continue the expansion of the industry. However, we've already made the switch. We're moving down a path where we're gonna produce renewable natural gas. We've got a pipeline interconnect already uh, completed. We'll be installing the gathering line that connects our facility with that pipeline this spring. Uh, and so we're, we're moving uh, forward with our renewable natural gas facility. But as I look to the future, I think that there's gonna be opportunities in both electric generation as well as renewable natural gas generation. Hey, thanks, Brian. Um, so I've got a question here, uh, kind of falls into the, the risk category. So I'm, I think I'm gonna initially uh, direct it to David and then if Jeannie or Brian have any comments they can share. Um, what are some ways that uh, 
some of the ways that producers can avoid bearing all the production and carbon risk? So, so um, I think that comes down again to the terms in the contract. And what I would say uh, really would address that then in two ways, because I wanna reiterate again, I am absolutely in favor of and think it's critical that the kind of measurement that Jeannie is talking about uh, be done. And I think that's an important role for our universities and extension to play as well, because what's needed is some establishment of a baseline and a credibility. The more credible our numbers are as an overall for different practices, the more credibility they're gonna be given in the marketplace and the more highly valuable they're going to be. To address the question, however, is understanding and even if we're using a, have a contract that contemplates a after the fact measurement of how did I see my, if, if it's a soil-based opportunity, uh, how am I seeing my soil carbon or organic matter uh, increase? It seems to me and what I've seen in contracts is using some, some, uh, some three or five year averaging kind of an aspect or something like that, that tries to take out some of that variability. Uh, I, I noted what Jeannie said in a kind of a high desert situation. I'm by no means, I'm the least of the soil scientists that are on this call, I'm sure. But what, as a lawyer, all I do is repeat things I've heard. I have heard that in those environments where I have short growing seasons, so there's a limited amount of time where there's organic activity, and the opportunity for a lot of moisture or limited moisture, that that can really have an impact. And that's the risk that you have to really try and avoid uh, uh, with that in, in adjusting your contract to make allowances for that so the producer's not the only one taking that risk. Looks like Jeannie would like to weigh in too. Yeah, I would, I would like to thank you, David, and thank you, Joe, for, and whoever asked the question. I'd like to honestly say that I don't feel um, a great deal of risk going in. Now, our family operation, we have signed a 10-year contract. The rest of my growers in Shanigo Wool Company, my farm group, we're working our way forward to bring that opportunity to every one of them. But I want to say this about risk. First of all, the reason maybe I don't, feel that is I feel like I've just gotten stronger. We used to be doing this on our operation on our own with our agency support and maybe some of our university extension support. But today I have a whole team of people invested in this, meaning um, Oregon State University's research team, which is leading this. And I think Dr. John Talbot may be even be on this call. Um, but first of all, they have a lot of experience and knowledge and they have built our research model. When we look at the carbon company that we're working with, they have a science team. That science team has been working with my science team and with us as ranchers at the things that we know can improve carbon sequestration. At each individual operation, think of it as an, it's an individualized plan. So we won't enter a contract without several things, conditions being met. One is an approved additionality plan. And that additionality plan is built by the rancher, the farmer rancher, in cooperation with our research team, our extension people, the carbon company science team. You've got a collective group of minds that's looking at that rancher's operation led by the rancher himself to say, here are the things that I would like to do. And we know that these things have a chance for improve. Then you have that three to five year time period that David mentioned, where you watch this thing change over time. So I don't really feel like I'm at risk. I feel like we got so much stronger and that together, we're helping ensure that we're gonna show regeneration on the land. Um, seems like I wanted to make one more comment with this. You know, most of the carbon market work has been focused around, and even models have been farm, focused around cropland and farming. And I just wanna comment, I'm not the scientist, but what we're learning is that uh, these broad grazing acreages, we, we graze far more land than we farm on the planet and even in this country. 
So there's so much upside potential for collaborative um, management additionality on these grazing and our large grazing operations to see an improvement, which is gonna be a win for every citizen. So I, I'm really happy to have the opportunity to work with a company that's actually taking steps to invest in grazing and carbon capture as opposed to farming and carbon capture. I think it's a really important segment that's behind what's happening with cropland. Hey, thanks. Um, so we're approaching the hour. I'm gonna post up one more question um, that I've got some interest in myself personally. Um, and that is we've focused a lot on carbon today and in the last couple of webinars, but one of the questions that came in today is there efforts to harvest nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus um, as you see related to your operations and is that part of your broader business plan as well? Well, I might take a stab at that and I'm assuming in, in, the, the question refers to some of the products we're producing and being able to capture the nitrogen and phosphorus uh, that or capturing those particular nutrients with, uh, you know, different technologies? Um, well, in our particular operation, we're, you know, utilizing the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur that, that comes through those digesters, uh, goes into the top, comes out the bottom. Uh, it's, it's fully digested. You know, the beauty of the solids, we separate our liquid and solid fractions. The solids is what, are what we call biofibers. We stockpile those in a compost-like uh, pile. You know, the EPA has documented that essentially those are 99.5% pathogen-free. So we don't have the issues with our compost that we spread on our land uh, that you might have with raw manure when it comes to, to pathogens like E. coli. Uh, the liquid effluent, of course, uh, currently or previously, the last uh, 10 years, we've been using that as our primary source of fertilizers. And that's how we utilize our nitrogen, our phosphorus, our protein. We don't buy in synthetic or inorganic forms of fertilizer, other than a very small amount of liquid nitrogen that we'll use with our herbicide really as a carrier and as a way to improve the efficacy of our herbicide program in our corn and soybean production. But that's it. I mean, we produce our own uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium from our digesters and our organic lee streams. Okay, Dave, do you want to make a comment in that regard? Sure. Uh, and uh, I do because some of the two, two things really, and it relates just exactly to what both, uh, again, Brian and Jeannie said. One is, uh, I absolutely agree that most of the focus has been on kind of row crop usage and things like that. And there is a lot of opportunities. And in addition to that, in the protein sector, I think that's where the greatest opportunity is to some, to some product differ, differentiation. Uh, I'm working with a project now that's uh, we've had uh, for a client that's had some public announcements out there, but they are adopting a technology that really part of it is, uh, actually I'm covering a couple of questions, that uh, because of the pretty quick uh, capture of the manure, scraping you know pretty much continuously, and then in their anaerobic digester process, they're continually recycling the gases with that and ultimately ending in a uh, a high quality fertilizer, and they'll end up capturing a, a significantly greater amount of the, of the nitrous oxide and, and other greenhouse gases that might otherwise be released. I know growing up, actually I didn't know it until now, but I know growing up on a cattle uh, feedlot, as soon as that steer takes a crap, things are happening. And what's really happening is that nitrous oxide, I'm going to use that's the wrong, maybe the wrong one, is starting to volatize and we're losing it. So that's going to be an opportunity, I think, to apply additional technologies. And for those customers that that's an important thing about, those customers are likely going to be interested in paying more, willing to pay more for the meat the protein that's being produced in those environments. And so it's a real value-based opportunity. And I wanna make one last point just because, and I'm not sure when we end here, here's what all of this means to me in, in broadly in ag policy. I've been an ag policy wonk since I was in, in college. I think we all know that for the last, let's say hundred years, probably longer, what have we seen in agriculture? We've seen an exchange for capital for labor. 
I, I, a farmer today produces far, far more acres of grain or cattle or whatever uh, than it took the number of people it took 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. How did he do that? He buys bigger equipment, he operates more land. So I reduced my labor for more capital. These are opportunities for exchanging capital for management, still high manage, or still high capital, unfortunately, but doing the management practices that Jeannie and Brian are talking about, we're gonna increase the overall value going to the operation. And that's a way, I think, to get away from just the really mega big uh, farming operations. Uh, cattle industry is a great opportunity for that. So that's a point I'd leave. You know, I'd like to just dovetail onto that, David. That's a very, very good point. One of the things that we're evaluating in the this Climate Smart Commodities Grant Program with Raceline, our alternative energy, our partner, is how to integrate uh, the, the opportunity to take cover crop biomass with livestock manure and, and use that in, in an ant, whether it be a lagoon style anaerobic digester or we'll, you know, we also have the, what's referred to as a continuously stirred tank reactor type digester for small and medium sized farms. And we think that that's gonna provide, and really what we had, I'll just give you an example. We had a 4,800 head permit with the DNR. We chose to actually reduce the permit size. We only had the 2,400 head of capacity constructed. And rather than expand our feedlot, we, we looked at uh, the benefits that we're gonna derive from expanding our biomass uh, supply and, and utilization in our digester. So we didn't need to expand our feedlot. We actually you know, probably are not going to grow our feedlot anymore in the future, at least not in my generation, uh, maybe the next generation, but, but the way in which we're gonna expand our digester facility is through biomass. And so we think that that uh, will market or lend itself well to medium sized producers. There's a lot of hog operations out there that are in that 2,500 to 10,000 head range. Uh, when you say, hey, they might be uh, a mile from another operation of the same size, let's uh, integrate our, our livestock manure, we'll integrate some biomass cover crops, maybe some prairie uh, cover crops with that manure, and suddenly you've got enough critical mass to, to build uh, and, and facilitate the construction and operation of a renewable natural gas facility uh, and an anaerobic digester. So I think that's what it's going to lend itself well. I, you know, un unfortunately, for those who are anti-livestock or anti-meat in our communities, uh, it's it's not going to be good news for them because we think it's actually a more environmentally sustainable approach uh, to, to more utilizing our, our you know most valued natural resources, our air, land, water, sun, and people. <clears throat> Jeannie? I'd like to follow, I'd like to follow along on that. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yes, because um, there's so many tangents there, but it's sort of like connecting the circle again. It's like reconnecting the circle. And what you just said, Brian, a part of the reason there's been so much anti-animal agriculture is because people don't truly understand the value that grazing animals have brought to the planet since the creator put both here, grazing animals and grasses that evolved together. I mean, we, we forget, we're so broken, our system, our disconnect, from, from the fact that so few of us are now involved in agriculture, people don't understand that. So we buy programs that reconnect the whole circle and this is what this does. Value, you started talking Joe and asking about the value questions. So the very fact that we're grazing these broad landscapes in a farm group, any ranch of any size that comes into my group, you know, all can fit and you can keep adding them. Our, we've been approved at the highest levels, our carbon companies approved us as its own project. So that means we can keep bringing these ranches in, we can grow this, we can replicate this. But imagine the whole circle here that I've been seeing for three years, I sell wool, which itself is 50% carbon. So once that's harvested, that's captured stored carbon for the life of the fiber. And I sell that fiber to textile and fashion brands who typically have supply chains that go all around the world, which are terribly destructive to the planet, right? And so now they have an opportunity. They also have 2030 sustainability targets. Every corporation is looking at their own footprint. So how do they take and switch their sourcing to a fiber supply that's being measured and verified and bringing a net ecosystem value they can now invest in that wool, 
pay that extra premium for that structured inset and their investment dollar goes into climate smart practices at scale, supports those family of various size agricultural. These, this potential new income stream is a game changer for small and medium sized family ranching operations in this country. This is the greatest potential upside news we have had in, ge in, in generations. And so um, maybe, I've, maybe I've said it all. I, I, I would love to be walking forward with a group of textile corporate brands who source our fibers, pay, pay for those insets, and together we're all stronger with the greatest winner at the very base of that, and that's the soil and the, and the landscape. That's what wins, and when it does, everybody else does. Yeah, I, I really think that circular uh, explanation and description you just provided is really what it's all about. And that circular Venn diagram, if you will, we, we utilize that a lot, uh, is, is at the heart of what we're trying to accomplish here. And it doesn't matter what size operation you are. Sustainability, though, does uh, mean that it has to be economically viable. But there are small operations that are economically viable that can be sustainable and, and monetize the, the efforts to capture and sequester carbon in a variety of different ways, just like there are large operations. Okay, thank you. So I think we're gonna bring us to a close. I'd like to, to thank our speakers today. Obviously a really progressive bunch, uh, definitely in the early adopter category. And so um, thanks for your leadership and uh, we'll be in touch. Uh,